afternoon, everyone. I sense the disappointment in the room yesterday when I didn't have any opening remarks. So, oh, now you have one. <laughs> I, I, I especially sense your disappointment, Matt. So today I came prepared. Um, <laughs> Twenty minutes in. Uh, something like that. Um, uh, let me start by making some uh, opening remarks on Russia uh, and our support for uh, Ukraine. Uh, first of all, the United States today imposed sweeping sanctions on over 150 individuals and entities in connection with Russia's unlawful invasion of Ukraine. This action targeted those engaged in sanctions invasion and those complicit in furthering Russia's ability to wage its war against Ukraine, among many others. The Department of State designated over 70 entities and individuals involved in Russia's future energy production and export capacity, including Russia's flagship Arctic LNG-2 project. The department also designated numerous entities producing and repairing Russian weapon systems, including the caliber cruise missile used by Russian forces against cities and civilian infrastructure in Ukraine, <coughs> and an individual affiliated with the Wagner Group who was involved in the shipment of munitions from the Democratic People's Republic of Korea to the Russian Federation. Concurrently, the Department of Treasury imposed nearly 100 sanctions on a wide range of targets, including Russian oligarchs, officials, entities that support Russia's war machine, and two additional banks. In addition to take, taking these sanctions against Russia today, we are also taking important steps to support Ukraine's recovery efforts. We are pleased to extend a warm welcome to Penny Pritzker, former Secretary of Commerce, who was named by President Biden as the Special Representative for Ukraine's economic recovery. As Secretary Blinken said when he visited Kyiv last week, we are committed to ensuring that Ukraine not only survives, but thrives. And Secretary Pritzker will work to ensure that is the case. We welcome Secretary, uh, Special Representative Pritzker to her new role and look forward to working with her. And finally, shifting to Moscow, I want to speak to the fact that today the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs informed Ambassador Lynn Tracy of the decision to declare two U.S. diplomats persona non grata. This unprovoked expulsion of our diplomatic personnel is wholly without merit, as is the case against a former Russian contractor of our embassy who was arrested for the supposedly nefarious task of performing such activities as providing our embassy with media clips. Yet again, Russia has chosen confrontation and escalation over constructive diplomatic engagement. It continues to harass employees of our embassy, just as it continues to intimidate its own citizens. We regret that Russia has taken this path, and you can certainly expect that we will respond appropriately to their actions. And with that, Matt. Okay. Um, <clears throat> when can we expect to see a response? Um, I don't want to preview Today? that. I don't want to preview that, but um, we have acted ex expeditiously in the past in response to such actions by the Russian Federation. Um, okay, and then just going, um, well, I presume that you don't have anything more to say about this. I mean, no. these, these two were, as far as, you, as far as the U.S. is concerned, were just doing their their jobs and not doing anything nefarious. They were just doing their jobs, as was the underlying employee who the Russian, you know, the Russian government arrested some months ago, was act was doing, you know, completely legal tasks that are in compliance with Russian law. Have they left yet? Or no? Uh, no, they have not. Okay. Anything else on that? I'll oh, say okay. this. But go, go ahead. Have you already summoned Russian ambassador? Uh, um, I, I don't want to speak to um, exactly the steps uh, that we are taking to respond, um, but you can certainly expect that we will do so. Okay. I'm not going to say when uh, we're going to take those steps. Um, uh, we will make those clear to the Russian government, and we will make them clear to you at the appropriate time. Come back to you, Mr. Did you? Um, I just want to go quickly to the sanctions you guys have announced today. Um, there are five entities that are based in Turkey, um, and I'm just wondering if you guys they are uh, entities in Turkish private sector. None of them are government entities. But I'm just wondering if you have given the Turkish government a heads up ahead of time. Uh, we often make the, take those steps. I am not aware whether we did it this, uh, in this instance or not. I'm happy to follow up. Right. Have you received any feedback from the Turkish government since the sanctions announcement of that? Not that I'm aware of. Right. Is the United States at all worried that these sanctions, because they come at this time when your uh, top priority is for Ankara to ratify Sweden's NATO membership. 
<coughs> are you at all concerned that the sanctioning of these entities in NATO allied Turkey might derail that process? Not at all. Um, uh, we have a, uh, a constructive warm relationship with the Turkish government. They are an important ally of ours. Um, uh, the president uh, met with President Erdogan not, uh, not too long ago and reiterated that fact after the meeting. Um, we continue to work with them uh, to communicate that NATO accession is important for Sweden and should happen as soon as possible. And we take uh, uh, President Erdogan's assurances that it will happen at great value. Uh, and we don't see these as any way connected. And we don't see that in any way uh, uh, these sanctions should have any of any impact at all on that accession. Same yeah. Same. Thank you very much. All the Turkish companies that are being sanctioned by the State Department. And so I just looked at a tweet just before the briefing and you said, and I quote, we impose sanctions on those maintaining Russia's capacity to continue this war, bolstering its ability to remain a global energy power. But looking at the statistics since, since the start of the war, the EU, your biggest partner in the war against Russia, let's say, um, they purchased more than $160 billion of fossil fuel since the start of the war. And would you not say the West, the Western companies, these European Union member states are actually funding the war against Ukraine? Because it's great, like well done, these five companies that, have, that, that, that were selling like sensors and measuring objects and like, you know, doing some shipping and stuff, servicing uh, regarding shipyards. But when you're looking at the real picture, would you say to Americans that we're doing every, everything we can whilst our biggest partners are basically paying billions and billions of dollars to Russia? I wouldn't conclude that at all. I would say we have worked hand in glove with our partners in the EU, with the EU, uh, European countries individually, to impose costs uh, on Russia uh, uh, through <laughs> sanctions and export controls. We recognize that a number of European countries uh, were importing large amounts of Russian fossil fuels before, the, before this war began, and they couldn't just turn those off immediately uh, without having their citizens you know, suffer through cold winters without any access to energy at all. But as part of, but we have seen th two things. One, European countries take important steps, as I said, to impose costs on Russia, and two, to tar start to take steps to wean themselves from Russian fossil fuels, Russian oil, Russian nat na uh, natural gas. We have worked with them to provide them with access to additional American natural gas to fund that transition, uh, uh, and we think those steps have been important and productive. Well, it's a fact, isn't it, that hundreds of billions are still being. Make, make those payments are being made to Russia, like you know, half the Russian oil is being transported uh, by Greek ships. Like this is all as, happening in real time. As I said, um, uh, it is, uh, it is. You cannot ask a country that was wholly dependent on Russian fossil fuels to go cold turkey if it means their citizens are going to have no access to electricity or heating through a cold winter. What we can ask countries to do, and we have asked countries to do, and have worked with them to do, is to take steps to transition from Russian fossil fuels. And I would remind you that a number of those countries in Europe are members of the G7, which has imposed a price cap on Russian oil to ensure that Russian revenues uh, are greatly reduced. And in fact, we've seen Russian revenues greatly reduced as a, price, uh, as a result of that price cap. So while we have not wanted to, to take Russian oil off the market because of the impact that that could have on energy prices worldwide and the impact it would have ener on energy prices uh, for American consumers, we have taken steps to ensure that while r the Russian oil remains available, the price that they're receiving for it and the profits that they receive for it are greatly diminished. Go ahead. Go ahead. And if I may ask to have the camera on, on the questioner who's asking, that's the only way how that's, we deal the life. Thank you so that's much. A, that's a new one. Uh, okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, uh, the department designated today. I didn't know we had a, I didn't know reporters, sometimes direct, I didn't know reporters do. served as the directors of the no, camera no, 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 operations I, in this I room. If I may ask, sometimes I, you guys I, do it, sometimes you I, don't. So that's the only way how makes I me wonder. Makes proof. me wonder what question's coming, so go Thank ahead. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, the department designated a Georgian Russian oligarch today as part of one of the designations you mentioned. And the guy is Mr. Parts Halate, uh, and a Russian intelligence service officer uh, for influencing Georgian society and, and um, politics for the benefit of Russia. I remind you that Mr. Parts Halate, this guy who sanctioned today, served as a chief prosecutor of Georgia for years and has been accused of oppressing opposition voices in Georgia. And he's one of the cronies of the major oligarch, Mr. Ivanishvili, uh, who controls the Georgian government uh, from the shadow. Um, on this note, today's uh, designation is sort of a recognition by both uh, State Department and the Treasury, recognizing the fact that FSB has a close ties 
with the Georgian government and operates freely, how this would influence your relations with Georgian government? I, I, I don't want to jump to that conclusion. I will say <laughs> that we sanctioned over 150 entities and individuals today, and I'm not going to be able to speak to, de I would say, for further, full details on any of those sanctions. Um, uh, I would refer you to the information that we released and the tr information that the Treasury re uh, Department released, but uh, with respect to 150 individuals and entities, I'm not able to speak to them in, de in detail cool. from this record. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, just a quick follow-up. Um, as a broad context, um, this year, this has been the second uh, designation of the uh, Georgian nationals. The first four was the Georgian Supreme Court judges. So in a broad context, how you see the relations with Georgia, because this is very unpre unprecedented fact, if you look at the 30 plus years of diplomatic relations that the US State Department had, I mean the US government had uh, with, with Georgia. So it has any effects on those relations? I, I don't believe so. I would say that we have always um, stood in solidarity with the people of Georgia and their desire to be a free and sovereign country. Um, with internationally recognized borders. And over the last 30 years, we have become strategic partners working together on our sh uh, with, towards our shared version of Georgia as a fully integrated member of the Euro-Atlantic uh, family and uh, no individual sanction uh, determination that we make um, uh, 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 changes that vision of ours or that relationship. Shannon, go ahead. Thank you. Um, in regards to the catastrophic flooding in Libya, I was wondering if you could give us an update on what the U.S. is doing to support the country in the wake of that tragedy. Um, more detail then what the president put out earlier this week promising emergency funding. Yeah, so I'll say that that um, uh, the United States through the U.S. Agency for International Development uh, has announced an initial uh, initial $1 million in humanitarian assistance. That's just a very initial payment to meet the most immediate uh, uh, needs on the ground as we um, uh, uh, get a disaster assistance response team on the ground, um, a USAID disaster assistance response team. We have activated one who will coordinate with the Libyan government and with uh, international humanitarian partners to identify priority needs uh, and deliver that assistance. And for further details, I would um, I refer you to USAID who can talk to them. But I do want to reiterate, as I think it's important to do whenever we talk about this situation, that we extend our deepest sympathies to the victims of those devastating floods, especially those who lost loved ones and are dealing with the uh, horrific aftermath today. Uh, Alex, actually, you've already had one. Go ahead. Do you know if the team is on the ground in Libya? Uh, I would refer you to USAID to speak to specifics. Um, go ahead. Um, it's a question about Poland. Uh, one of uh, the media outlets in Poland informed earlier today that officers from overseas criminal investigations, which is a program run by Diplomatic Security Service, warned uh, the Polish authorities about a new channel of illegal immigration to the United States from India via Poland and uh, via Mexico. Now, supposedly, there was a corrupt cell at the Polish foreign ministry that operated this channel. Uh, and again, this is an information coming from State Department, from the dip, uh, Diplomatic uh, Security Service. What, and what, just, just so I know what I'm talking about, what is the source of this information? A, a public it report? It is one of the Polish media outlets yeah. uh, called Onet uh, PL. And um, uh, so do you have any comments on this? Can you confirm? I, I, I cannot confirm those reports. And as always, I wouldn't want to speak to private conversations between our two governments. Saeed, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Switching topic to the Palestinian-Israel issue. A uh, couple of quick questions on the visa uh, waiver. It seems that uh, uh, Gaza Americans are required to document and prove their residency abroad. To the best of your knowledge, is that required of other Americans? Um, what I will say about that is, so Israel just uh, uh, in the last few days announced new proce travel procedures uh, for Gaza. I believe it was uh, uh, on Monday of this week. Those new procedures will allow U.S. citizens who are registered on the Palestinian Population Registry for Gaza to apply for visa-free admission uh, into Israel. Um, as we have said all along, we recognize that there is a different security situation uh, in Gaza, and so there would be different procedures. Um, and what I will say about that is that we are going to monitor the implementation of those procedures and make sure that Americans, uh, all Americans, are treated equally in making any determination about Israel's potential admission into the visa waiver program. One more question on this issue. Uh, there are reports that uh, the determination of whether Israel enters the visa waiver program sits with the secretary, uh, with secretary Blinken, including, you know, apparently a planned announcement on October 6th. And uh, according to the statute, it's supposed to be 
the secretary of DHS said. Can well, you clarify this? Or? Well, I think we'll follow the statute. <laughs> Obviously, I, I no, you, you were right about what the statute says. The secretary does, the decision does not rest with the secretary. The secretary plays an important role, but as the, the, the procedure the statute lays out is that the secretary makes a recommendation to the Se secretary Blinken, secretary of state makes a recommendation to the secretary of Homeland Security who makes the final determination. I can tell you that neither of those steps have happened yet. The secretary has not made a recommendation, so obviously without that, the Secretary of Homeland Security has not made a final determination. A couple more quick questions. The, the Palestinian Authority claims well, that. Sure. Sure. If Saeed yields sure. the floor. Well, yeah, but it's just about this 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 line that you just said that um, the the new um, Israeli uh, guidelines allow American citizens who are on the Palestinian registry list in Gaza, Gaza to apply for a visa waiver to waiver entry. Right? Uh, That's what you said. Yeah, yeah. correct. How is that different to, than, get, than, than, than getting a visa? Um, there are different steps. The same as with no, 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 there are because the same as there's the ESTA program for it's the same as in yeah, America. Yeah, 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 I, I know. It's not something that, that not, not something that you apply for. It's something it's that you, you register cur, for. Okay. Cur, cur. Now, what you just said was that that okay, Palestinian Americans who uh, you know from or who have family in Gaza who want to go there can apply for it. That's the same and, thing as a, that, that, that is exactly it, the same thing as trying to get a visa. The procedures, our understanding, so first of all, Israel just announced these several days ago, our understanding and our expectation of the procedures is that they will not be the same as getting a visa and that they, they will be. Won't. So it will <coughs> they, be a formality? It will be, it will, they will, it be, will be like ESTA? It will be, I, I'm not going to compare a foreign program to our program. I was using that as an example to say well, that. But that, in that, fact, that's what the law says. You have to, it has to be reciprocal, that, right? Which cur, means that the I just, U.S. Program, I just meant, I just meant not the exact same the technicalities. Same, I meant not the exact same. It has to be the same as the U.S. program as it relates yes, to yes, American though, citizens. Though we do recognize that there's maybe slightly different procedures for going in, in to Gaza because of the different security well, situation there. If, the, if um, there's slightly different procedures, then that's not reciprocal. But they still have to allow visa-free travel. Well, there is there's just, just <laughs> and I think that even supporters of Israel will, will, will recognize that allowing complete reciprocity, in other words, for them to fulfill the criteria that is mandated under the law, the U.S. law, that they can't do it without sacrificing their own national security interests. And what you just said is that they're allowing Palestinian Americans to apply for visa waiver entry, but that is exact. It, uh, you know, I, I, in what world is that not the same thing as that? So, is, is, is so, to apply so, for a visa. Uh, Where, what what world is that? So, in? I'm not able to get into the very technical details of what this will this look like. Hold on, hold on. I know, this but the, what, but I'm, let me finish the answer. That Israel just announced a few days ago, and that we have only begun to monitor, uh, uh, and they have only begun to implement. But our understanding is that this this um, uh, uh, new process. For people traveling to Gaza or residents of Gaza, will not be the burdensome visa, uh, uh, you know, the burdensome process that is involved in acquiring a visa. And again, as we have said, as we have said a number of times, we will monitor it. And if it doesn't meet our requirements for entry into the visa waiver program, Israel will not be admitted okay. into the program. And they have 16 days to prove that, right? Correct. Yeah. And Correct. If they don't meet it in 16 days, they have to go back and qualify. Under the Correct. visa rejection rate, the visa overstay Correct. rate, for a new and everything else. for a new fiscal year, right? Can I just follow up on uh, the claim of the Palestinian Authority that Israel is withholding about eight hundred million dollars? I don't know if you're aware of it, and their tax revenues. Are you aware of that? I, I've seen the reports. I don't have a response okay, to. I, I, I'm not able to. I'm not able to verify them. There's there's going to be a donors meeting, and I'm sure that the United States will be there uh, in New York and so on. And this issue may may come up. Uh, my second question uh, sure. also related to this: Will there be a meeting with any Palestinian official on the sideline of the of the UNGA, uh, To the best of your knowledge, I have not yet announced uh, any meetings by either the secretary or other members of this department, and we'll make those announcements in the coming days. Thanks. Follow up. There you go. There you go. Uh, there's a follow up. Follow up <laughs> yeah, with go the ahead. visa waiver program. Okay. So this follows up with the visa waiver program. Uh, given that Gaza is controlled by the terrorist organization Hamas, what are the reasons for the Biden administration and the State Department insisting Israel give unfettered transit access to Americans 
heading into or exiting the Gaza Strip in exchange for Israel being admitted to the visa waiver program, and I have a follow-up. Uh, follow wait, what was the, the question that we are insisting? Are you asking, are we insisting that American citizens be able to... to, to the question be, is, uh, uh, well, I guess, basically, uh, I find it in response, if the Biden administration is insisting Israel give unfettered transit access to Americans heading into or exiting the Gaza Strip in exchange for Israel being admitted to the visa waiver program, and the second follow-up question is Yeah, we, we, let's say, as I just said, we do, we do expect that American citizens uh, traveling into or out of Gaza be re seated reciprocally. The yes. Okay, yeah. but this, the that, second that, 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 nothing to do with creating the visa waiver criteria. That was Congress. Correct. Okay, the second part of that is what responsibility for an attack or attacks will the State Department take if someone headed into or out of Gaza exploits this new access and attacks Israeli citizens and tourists. I, I, I appreciate you coming and asking questions. I do think that's a, a bit of an uh, absurd framing of the question. Again, we are talking about American citizens and their, acts, their ability to be treated without discrimination, which is something that we expect. That said, we do work with Israel to ensure their security. We are 100% to, committed to the security of the Israeli people, um, uh, and we work with them uh, uh, on a daily basis to ensure that. There's a little confusing about America. Uh, how can American citizens be living in Gaza? Or, uh, what is the prevalence of that in the first place? I, I don't have the numbers, but there are American citizens that live in Gaza and all over the world. Just one more on yeah. Israel. Uh, uh, there was a bit of a kerfuffle um, yesterday or the day before in Israel over the transfer of some armored vehicles to the Palestinian Authority. Um, I asked, I did get a, a very well, I'll say lame response. It <laughs> um, wasn't of me, about, was it? I don't get No, it wasn't not, from you. My but response but wasn't. No, it, but, I, but, in, but, at least in know, this instance, for, I hope my response well, is not characterized as lame. We don't comment <laughs> on these transfers, but, you know, frankly, this, this is, this, this would, a transfer of armored vehicles to the, to the Palestinian Authority, while it may be well-intentioned and intended to, like, help the PA uh, police areas of, uh, of the West Bank, um, there are no details about it. So how many vehicles were there and how much are they worth? Uh, I do not have those details. I will give one answer you'll probably not, you'll reject as lame and then a, 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 sec, a follow up answer. One, one is that we don't comment on the details of, of these transfers, which I guess you've already preemptively rejected. <laughs> and, and the well, second, and the second though we do, I'm just saying that it's not, and, it doesn't, but, it doesn't no, the second thing I was gonna say is, the second thing I say, which we do not, you know, we, but, but we do not provide weapons to the Palestinian Authority. And, and no one said there were I, weapons. I, 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 like, yes. you know. Right. Armor, Sorry, we don't. Yeah. Right. But hold on. Leon gave up the floor a minute ago. Do you want to? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Leon, I, I remembered your question. You didn't have your hand back up. I got the, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very, very different. Uh, I was wondering whether you have any reaction or comment or how you view uh, the fact that Cuba is um, heading a uh, Group of 77 summit uh, as of tomorrow for two days in, in La Habana uh, with leaders such as Lula expected and 30 or such leaders. Uh, what is your view on that? And in that context, of course, uh, could you give us an update or read out of the meetings uh, apparently that the deputy Cuban foreign minister had with people in this house? and? Uh, uh, any people in his or, house, or well, it, no, in the, people in the state, in the state, department, people the state department. Yeah, yeah. Or, and where, yeah. or where, in fact, if it was actually here or not. I think um, he also met uh, somebody at the White House. Uh, Assistant Secretary uh, and Nichols. Yeah. Um, so I don't have any any comment on, on the, the the first question you asked. I will say, with respect to um, the the meeting that involved the State Department that you asked about. Uh, on Monday, Assistant Secretary for Western Hemisphere Affairs Brian Nichols met with uh, the Cuban uh, Vice Foreign Minister. Um, at this meeting, Se Assistant Secretary Nichols and the Vice Foreign Minister discussed human rights, migration, and other issues of bilateral interest. And uh, it, it follows, you know, a number of means. We do routinely meet with officials uh, uh, from the Cuban Embassy uh, here in Washington. But not at that level. Not at that level. No, I mean, not always someone here. But we do we do regularly have discussions about those issues. Yeah. yeah. And any progress whatsoever um, on whether or not Cuba should be lifted from his list of state-sponsored, uh, uh, stateside sponsored terrorism? We have not made any determination that I can report today. Can I ask on Asia here, Matt, what is the latest on efforts to try to restore democratic rule there, and are you guys going to declare this a coup? Um, 
look, we continue to monitor the situation there. We to in continue to engage uh, with partners in the region. Secretary Blinken uh, has had you know a number of conversations over the past weeks, uh, both with partners in the region and other countries around the world around this. Um, one of our first priorities is still to secure the, pre the, the release of President Bazoum, his family, uh, and all the members of his government uh, who were unlawfully detained. Uh, and I don't have any update on a determination by this department. When was the last time anyone from this building spoke with Bazoum? Uh, I'm not, I, I'm not aware, you know, I don't track all of like the assistant secretary calls and others, so there may have been one recently that I don't have at my fingertips. I'm happy to, to, to What about to members of the junta? When was the last engagement when Tori visited? Uh, again, because we have an embassy there that regularly, you know, conducts its own engagements and the, the of course, um, the Africa Bureau conducts its own engagements. I don't know of the, the last engagement. And that was you know there. who will be representing Niger at the United Nations next week, and would the U.S. grant a visa to a member of the junta if they were to try to represent? So I do not know who uh, will be representing. I will say as a general matter, um, uh, we have an obligation as the host country, the host nation for the United Nations to grant visas to people who are accredited members, who, are who the United Nations has determined uh, are accredited members representing their government. Um, uh, those decisions, our visa decisions, of course, are, are confidential, but we do have an obligation to admit people uh, for meetings at the UN. Even if they're from a junta that overthrew if, what if you the, call a if the United, field. if their their you know accreditation is uncontested at the United Nations, and the United Nations uh, is welcoming them to a meeting, it is our obligation to provide uh, a, a visa. This I would say a visa for vi for purposes of attending the UN, not for any other purposes uh, uh, of visiting the United States. Let's go ahead. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I want to go back to the SARS Caucasus. Three questions, but very quick. Uh, Special <laughs> Advisor Bono is in the region, as I understand. He uh, was in Yerevan today. Do you have any readout uh, for, for us? No specific readout other than he continues to engage uh, both on the short-term priority, which is to, re, uh, uh, to reopen the Lachin Corridor, and of course the, our long-term priority, which I shouldn't say long-term, but we really want it to happen as soon as possible, which is to um, reach a peaceful resolution to the overall matter. So he'd be visiting Baku as well? I'm not going to co comment on his specific, but if you, if you put a call into the appropriate bureau, I'm sure they can give you oh, detail. Oh, oh. So the second topic, uh, we got Ibadoglu from Azerbaijan. His case we have discussed uh, multiple times in this room. It came up during today's uh, congressional hearing, and uh, the impression was that there was a question about him, but the answer was about by diplomacy. You know, as the secretary mentioned, that she would go back uh, to, to the senators uh, with a uh, more detailed answer. Um, if quiet diplomacy <laughs> is not working, because you know he has been in jail for a long time uh, already, his health is deteriorating, my question is, at what point you will stop being deeply concerned and ask for his release? Uh, I have, you have, so I don't think you should say, that you should conclude that quiet diplomacy precludes that we're asking for his release. I have said publicly from this podium that we urge the Azerbaijan, uh, Azerbaijani government to immediately release him. So you, you have, you, you, I have, you I have said, to respect him I, I have said before that we are troubled by his arra uh, arrest and detention and we urge his immediate release. I appreciate that. So. My last question. On Georgia, I don't want to let this question slide. It was a very important question from my Georgian colleague, because this does I disclose. I love it when we have reporters it, arguing with it, me in the middle. It does disclose, you know, very uh, important detail about this, uh, you know, how this Georgian go dream government operates, pushes Russian propaganda. There are multiple examples just uh, in recent history. We all have seen this famous video of Georgian Prime Minister talking about, you know, how Russia started, you know, Ukraine war uh, because of. Uh, quote unquote, NATO expansion. Yet he is able to travel to the United States. He was here last last month in a private trip, you know, taking his uh, son to American schools. My question is, uh, is, is it fair to expect uh, from the United States government to go further, not only sanction the former, but a few current officials who push Russian propaganda in Georgia? Uh, we take uh, sanctions actions when we feel it is appropriate to do so, uh, and I don't have any to preview at this time. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, one question on Iraq, the U.S. Treasury Assistant Secretary Rosenberg, she was in Iraq and met with the Iraqi officials about the corruption and also smuggling the dollar to abroad, especially Iran. Then are you still concerned about the dollar cash flow from Iraq to Iran? And how do you deal with the banks that are still operating with risks? So let me say that you're right. Um, Assistant Secretary Rosenberg was uh, in Baghdad. Uh, uh, September 12th and 13th, she met with the uh, Iraqi pr Prime Minister uh, as well as leaders of the Central Bank of Iraq, Ak, 
Trade Bank of Iraq, the Iraqi uh, Financial Intelligence Unit, as well as representatives from the Iraqi private banking sector. Uh, both sides recognizing the opportunities and challenges ahead for further improving the Iraqi financial sector, committed to continue working together to take positive steps towards meaningful and lasting reforms that will raise Iraq to international standards and prevent fraud, sanctions evasion, terrorist financing, and other illicit activities. Then, me, the, the, one more follow-up. Yeah. Then, do you say that there are still banks in Iraq that are trying to smuggle dollar cash flow from Iraq to Iran and Syria? Uh, I, I'm not going to make any assessment of that from this podium today. Matt, thank you. Go ahead. So, last Next. month, the state, the state Department called on Nicaragua to release in prison Catholic Bishop Rolando Alvarez. First question: Have you heard anything back from the Ortega government on that on that de on that demand to get him freed? So I won't I won't speak to any private diplomatic conversations, but I will say um, that we continue to condemn. Uh, the Nicaraguan government's unjust detention of Bishop Alvarez. Uh, we are closely engaged in working on this case. Uh, we share the concerns of the international community about his well-being, um, and we continue to call on President Ortega and Vice President Murillo to release him immediately and unconditionally so he can continue his pastoral work, pastoral work uh, and we will continue to, to uh, be focused on this case. And some wonder whether he's even alive. Do you have any proof he's uh, alive? I, I, I'm not gonna speak to, to his uh, uh, status. Uh, it, is, it is our, cons our, our uh, priority though that, that he be released and that the Nicaraguan government account for his whereabouts and okay, help. One on, and one on Nigeria, please, thank you. Uh, a Catholic, a tragic story here. A Catholic seminarian was killed when his rectory was set on fire just recently. A seminarian's name was Neman Danlami. Why is Nigeria still not on the country's a particular concern list when, he's, when we see Christians there being killed routinely? So two things. One, we do remain concerned uh, by some state government's use of uh, use and enforcement of anti-defamation and blasphemy laws against individuals expressing their freedom uh, of, of uh, their, their beliefs or opinions about religion. Uh, we believe that laws prohibiting insults to any religion often reinforce intolerance for differing views. Uh, we remain concerned about intercommunal conflicts uh, uh, that at times can take on religious overtones and the effect of violence against members of the religious community. Uh, but I will say, uh, last November, as part of the department's annual review of international religious freedom designations globally, where we looked at countries around the world, uh, the department determined that the religious freedom conditions in Nigeria did not meet the legal threshold for Nigeria to be designated as a country of particular concern. So while we do uh, 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 you know, remain concerned about the, the, uh, some of the developments in the country, there's a legal threshold that in this, uh, in this case we just did not find was met. Finally, Nagorno-Karabakh, one U.S. lawmaker recently wrote a letter to President Biden saying, quote, the United States must recognize this genocide and act accordingly to save as many lives as possible, end quote. What is the State Department's message to suffering Armenian Christians? Uh, that we want the, the, the Lachin Corridor to be opened immediately. We have made that clear. Secretary Blinken has engaged with the leaders of both Armenia and Azerbaijan to make it clear that we want the Lachin Corridor to be uh, opened immediately to, um, uh, to address the uh, really uh, dire humanitarian situation in Nagorno-Karabakh. How much time do you think these people have? Go ahead. I, I, I have any further. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, now, uh, today, uh, the UK, France, and Germany officially announced that they're going to keep the nuclear non-proliferation measures against Iran in place, as, which also includes arms and missiles embargo after the JCPOA transition day on October 18th. Um, this year, and that they have jointly notified the coordinator of the JCPOA. Um, the U.S. does have his, its own uh, sanctions against Iran. Is, is the Biden administration um, talking with other uh, countries about this subject, keeping um, the, these missile, uh, the arms uh, sanctions in place once they expire in, in October? We are uh, coordinating closely, closely with a range of allies and partners, including our E3 and EU partners on their transition day plans. Uh, uh, and and um, we'll consider additional uh, counter -pro proliferation efforts going forward. Uh, we have imposed a number of sanctions, as you, as you referred to in your question on Iran, and of course will not hesitate to continue to do so in the future if appropriate. One more question. 
uh, saying I, that they will not go for snapback, uh, but they will um, transfer some of the UN sanctions that are due to expire on the 18th of October. And I was wrong yesterday. I said the 8th, October 18th. Yeah. Um, that they will make make some of those sanctions uh, national uh, sanctions. I, I would say that we are working closely with our European allies, including the members, of course, of the E3, to address the continued threat that Iran poses, including on missiles and arms transfer, um, with the extensive range of unilateral and multilateral tools uh, that are at, at our disposal. And we will continue to work uh, on that as we lead up to the so-called transition day and, of course, thereafter. Well, yeah, but, I mean, you know, do you, do you think that it's a good thing that they're doing this? Uh, we are in close contact with them about what the appropriate. That's fine. I, I know. I, 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 but what do you I, mean you're in close contact? I mean, that, okay. Of course you're in close contact with them. You're in close contact with them every day about any number of things. I, I want to know if you have an opinion. If the U.S. government has an opinion on what they announced. Uh, I, I will say that we are going to continue to coordinate with them on what the appropriate next steps are, but I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep our conversations with them private. Um, well, no, okay. uh, well, what do you think, it, forget about the conversations, what, what, what do you think is the appropriate next, what are the appropriate next steps? I think we should continue to uh, uh, hold uh, Iran accountable, but I'm not going to preview what the next steps might be. So you're okay with, 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 with transition day and the UN sanctions uh, going away with no snap. Uh, yeah, I think you have to have to remember, of course, that th those are not the only sanctions that we have on Iran and that uh, our allies and partners have on Iran, and we'll continue to work with our allies and what other steps are appropriate to take. No, but if the UN sanctions, if the arms embargo is lifted, as it will be on the 18th of October, right, everything that you're talking about in terms of, like, you know, transfers of weapons to, uh, to and from Russia for use in Ukraine or elsewhere, are no longer, um, they're, 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 you know, they're, they're no longer covered. I, I will say there's some time between now uh, and October 18th, yeah, and we're going to. Just a, a month. <laughs> long time in government, in, 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 in government, in government time, and we'll continue to work with them on the appropriate steps uh, in response to that day. Uh, I, I, we had, Gita was still, I think, had a follow-up before. Yeah, right? thank you. Um, in two days will be the um, anniversary of Mahsa Amini's death while in the custody of the morality police in Iran. Recently, uh, her father has been, um, is being harassed. He's been threatened um, not to make the anniversary a big thing, not to talk about it. Um, they have forbidden him from uh, doing interviews. Um, any comments on this? Yeah. Uh, first, I'd say this is reportedly the fourth time in the last two weeks that the Iranian regime has summoned uh, Masa's father for questioning. Uh, the regime continues its relentless intimidation of her family and the families of slain protesters. Uh, but the regime cannot intimidate the people of Iran into silence. The world is watching its treatment of these families and the ongoing intimidation of journalists and abuse of peaceful protesters. Um, uh, and we will continue to watch it closely and take whatever steps are appropriate to respond to it. Uh, well, let me do fun. Okay, up. go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just, uh, I mean, following up on Gita's mm -hmm. uh, point about Maso's anniversary, just a few days ago you announced a hostage deal that uh, basically uh, left behind three U.S. Uh, other cases. Uh, Jamshid Sharmat, Afshin Vatani, and Shahab Dalili. Today, uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee in Congress heard that the deal does nothing to halt further hostage taking, and it allows the regime to divert resources intended for humanitarian purposes to security forces, missile program, and proxy groups. Plus, it undermines the san international sanctions regime. Now, does the United States really stand with the Iranian people, or are your statements of support just paying lip service to the brave Iranian people who are fighting for democracy? So there, were, that, there was a lot there. Let me say a few things about it. One, um, uh, all of the money that uh, Iran would obtain access to under the terms of this arrangement are funds that Iran already owns. 
under the terms of the arrangement that that um, uh, would that would be that would allow the release of five American citizens, uh, Iran would only have access to these funds for humanitarian purposes. So, for for uh, purposes of food, medicine, and other things that do in fact benefit the Iranian people and not the regime. Um, with respect to to the the overall question, I look. There were five American citizens who were being wrongfully detained in Iran. The secretary believed, the president believed, that we needed to do everything possible to get those Americans home. That's what we are trying to do. It does not mean there are not other people in Iran who we are trying, who, whose release we are pressing for. Uh, there not, does not believe we are, there are other people in Iran who we believe are not being harassed and intimidated uh, by the Iranian government. It does not believe that we endorse all of Iran's other actions on a range of activities. Of course we don't. We will continue to hold Iran accountable for the actions to repress its own people. We will continue to hold Iran accountable for its actions to destabilize the region. But when it comes to the decisions you have to make in this department, sometimes you have to make the decision of whether you want to leave these five Americans in prison under horrible conditions <coughs> without access to their families. Uh, one of them had been in jail for over eight years, or do you want to bring them home? They're not perfect choices sometimes. They're not uh, e easy decisions. But we have made the decision <coughs> that we want to bring those Americans home. Do you have an go ahead. On oh, the Michelle, go ahead. Sorry. The prisoner swap, when will it happen? Uh, I do not. Not as I, only thing I'll say is what I said that not this week. I'm not going to give an update on on where those funds are in the in the, their transit from South Korea to the ultimate bank in in Qatar. No, no, no let, me, let me go to some other people that haven't. Nice try, Alex. Thank you, Kazuba for some international news, cousin form. Uh, I have a question about the. <clears throat> Uh, planning uh, meetings between American and Kazakhstan delegations uh, during uh, the summit of uh, the United Nations General Assembly, including uh, within the framework of the C5 plus one platform. Could you tell about uh, about the agenda and what key issues will be discussed? So I will say that the C5 plus one is an important framework. Uh, the secretary uh, held a meeting at the ministerial level uh, of the C5 plus one some months ago. But we're not ready at this point to announce any meetings at the United Nations. Uh, go ahead, and then we'll do we'll wrap up. Secretary Blinken planned to raise the issue of the Black Sea Grain Initiative during the high level week next week at the UN. I would say that he raises the Black Sea Grain Initiative in just about every. I sit in a lot of a lot of his meetings with his foreign counterparts, and it comes up in just about every meeting uh, because uh, it doesn't just affect uh, Ukraine. Uh, but it affects really every country around the world, especially those countries that have suffered most from Russia's continued bombing, uh, its continued blockade of the Black Sea, and its continued bombing of uh, ports and other facilities uh, 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 where Ukraine is shipping grain to nations that really depend on it. Well, that I, know, uh, I guess one more, and this has to do with yesterday with the Bahrain meetings. Um, did the did human rights questions come up at all during the discussion? I realize that they weren't part of the MOU that was signed. Um, but as you know, uh, and as you have commented on before, there are you know, several people uh, who are on hunger strike in Bahraini prisons for uh, crimes that, that, that the critics of the, of the Bahraini government say are you know, ridiculous and without, without standing. So, was this something that the secretary raised? It was. He raised human rights concerns and made clear um, that human rights are a pil pillar of our policy uh, across the Middle East and North Africa. And then I'll answer, you know, I got asked, asked a question about one specific human rights case yesterday that I couldn't answer because the meeting was ongoing. Right. Uh, but I can confirm today that, yes, the secretary did raise Mr. Al Kawaja's case. Uh, okay. And, but even though there hasn't been any positive response, or maybe there has been. Has there been a positive response? I, I, I can't speak to the. You know, okay. Well, so group. assuming then that in, uh, that there hasn't been, you you went ahead and signed the MOU anyway. Look, yes, we believe that uh, as is true okay. with our so, number so of our human countries. Rights is not actually the primary. Uh, uh, as is policy as is true with a number of countries, um, we have the ability to work together on things where we okay. can advance cooperation, but still raise okay. where we have concerns. Well, was that the only uh, specific case that was raised? Uh, I don't. I don't. I'm not aware of other specific cases. Okay. So. Thank you. All right. Thanks.